Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce you to uh, Rob, and he will uh, do his part. Um, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Roberta and Justin. Um, yeah, my name is Rob Kofshank, and I am a member, along with Ellie Willoughby, Sarah Peebles, and Stephen Humphrey of this collective. And uh, it is called Our Favorite Bees. And this is my favorite bee. This is Agapostomum bresses. Um, and it lives here in Toronto. It lives in much of North America. Um, and it lives in our backyard. And Sarah made a nice little sign for this lovely little bee that's uh, making a tunnel in the backyard. Um, and so these things live, um, they're solitary bees. They live in tunnels. They live underground. Um, and they're a little, they're, their living arrangements are a little different from other solitary bees that you might encounter in later in this presentation in that some of them live in basically condominiums. Like each bee will have its little sort of apartment, uh, but they will all be sort of connected through this um, tunnel that leads up from the ground. So there'll be a little little mound of earth here around the the tunnel and then it, it will branch off and there might be you know three or four or five six different female bees with their nests underground there um, so yeah I just I realized when I was putting this together that this is in fact one of my favorite bees because I have a bunch of pictures of it these are all my photos and most of them are in our own backyard um, this is actually an extremely common bee like once you are aware of it you'll you'll start seeing it everywhere um, and um, one of the places you'll see it is on Howland Street. There's a mural uh, by Nick Sweetman, and this is Ca Toronto's official bee. We're lucky that we have a, a, an official bee in this city, and this is it. So I was kind of lucky to get this special bee uh, to do my thing around. And so the art itself um, is based on this project that Sarah and Stephen did called Odes to Solitary Bees. Um, in which Stephen made uh, poetry based on actual individual bees um, that we had encountered in the, the structures that Sarah had built as part of her art practice. Um, we've built these sort of observational structures that uh, we can observe and listen to because this is the Canadian Music Centre. This is also very much a sound piece. Um, so Sarah is recording these things and, and we're filming them. Um, and then Stephen has written a series of poems about various individual bees. So uh, each of us took one of these poems to base our work around, and this was mine, um, a bee that Stephen named Dexter, um, who is actually a male bee. Uh, and it found its way into one of these wooden tunnels, which is really unusual because it's a, a, actually, as you'll see in my piece, a, a ground nesting bee. It lives, normally lives underground. And this, um, this bee just decided to hang out in this tunnel that we'd actually built for other bees. And um, if you want to hear a really horrible secret, uh, do you want me to spoil the ark for you? Uh, I will spoil the ark for you. I was looking at this video and realizing why this bee is taking such care of its body. In, it's actually infested with mites. Um, the poor little thing is, is really trying to get rid of um, some mites all over its body. But we will pretend that that did not happen. Um, we will pretend that that's just a nice, happy bee um, with a good sense of self-care. Uh, and I will pretend. Okay. Agapostman, that says the uh, bicolored green metallic sweat bee. Um, so this is Stephen's poem, The Ode to Dexter, that I decided to base a piece on. And in Stephen's poem, um, Dexter is, um, you know, a bit, a bit um, self-absorbed. And the, the females have forgotten about him. And I, I thought that was sad. So I decided to make a bee that had not forgotten about Dexter and was actually still very much caring about Dexter. Um, and what we, we built this in is a, 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 a object called a Teatro Lambe Lambe, which is uh, named after the sort of Brazilian slang for 
of this street photographer camera. And there's a, this would be a whole other talk about these street photographers in uh, Brazil. There's also a really um, vibrant culture of this that existed in India, where these people would make these little portrait cameras that would be sort of take your picture and develop it on the spot with really funky chemistry. Um, so a while back, some uh, Brazilian puppeteers decided that they liked this format, and they came up with this thing called the Teatro Lambe Lambe, which is sort of in the same um, form factor as, as the street camera. It was based on the street camera. And the idea of the Lambe Lambe is it's a, poet or a theater for one. Like, it's, it's a very intimate um, thing. It's designed not for an audience, but for just you and the puppeteer. Um, to, to tell a little story just for you. And there's there's quite a lot of interest internationally. I mean, we're part of this, and Sarah got into this because she discovered a few of these at the uh, puppet studio that she was um, just renting some space in. That, and thanks very much to the puppet mongers who've been really very helpful with all this. I'll, I'll just play a brief little clip. Um, if you're interested in this, and I suggest just you know Googling around and finding um, the history of these sorts of things, but this this clip I liked because it had it showed you the kind of diversity of all the different people who were building these things. They're very different styles of puppetry. Um, so we decided not to. Well, we actually just decided not to make a an actual puppet show, but rather just be inspired by this to have like a little. Um, a little bit of theater or a little bit of sculpture for one person. And so we kind of stole the form factor without the, the performance aspect or um, and not really so much the, the cultural aspect. But we were inspired by the way these things are decorated. Um, they're usually very colorful on the outside and, and then there's something cool going on on the inside. Um, so maybe we will go back and this will work. So that's the lamb of that way. So I started building one. Um, that the inside I constructed out of styrofoam and you can see there's a fair bit of wiring in here uh, because I did a bunch of lighting and each of us also um, had a little video player that played the video that we that Stephen based his poems on so each of us has the B of the poem uh, in our Lambe Lambe and that's what my finished and installed one looked like um, I painted it, it doesn't really show in the picture, but I, I painted it with a metallic green paint and also yellow paint to match the color scheme of the bee itself. Um, and the other aspect was a physical specimen of the bee. So there's an actual agapostomon and uh, a little model of its nest. Um, they, you can see where it's made like this little volcano structure. It looks like sort of Mount Fuji where they dig this stuff out. And sometimes you'll get a little tube. Like there, there'll be like a little smokestack that they build um, as the entrance to their hole. And so I, I just based this on the one that we have in our yard. And I took, I felt a little guilty actually taking flowers away from bees that were actively using them. I was out there in the scissors in the morning and I was chasing bees away and cutting the flowers. But um, I had fun uh, drying the flowers for this. So that they, each, each of these um, installations comprises a lambe lambe, um, an actual bee specimen or set of bee specimens, and a little um, bit of vibrational art. So there's the, the, the inside that I constructed. Um, I made the bee uh, watching a little TV, and I put um, Stephen's poem on a little TV um, using a tiny, you wouldn't be able to see this on the street screen, but it's a little, um, it's a tiny little video screen, um, just postage stamp sized. And, um, these things are quite delightful. Um, so I had fun doing this, and it, it actually kind of reminded me of something I was doing back in the 90s, um, playing with um, doing poetry on computer screens and using software to pace out the, the rhythm of the poem. So I had fun building this little TV. Um, a little picture of Dexter, a little phone that never rings, and um, a baby bee. Uh, so that, that is actually what the, the larvae look like. They're, they build little cribs for them, and they um, make, leave a little blanket. There's all of Stephen's poem appearing on this TV, so I shot a little video. And you can see the, the actual, the larger video screen that's built into the Lambe Lambe uh, there as the poem um, 
sort of unfurls on the screen. Uh, I had a little trouble because the, the little aspect ratio of that screen doesn't match the 1950s TV that I wanted, so I had to, I had to get a little bit creative. Um, and then at the, at the end of this, the camera will sort of pull back and show you the inside. The, the one thing that I actually didn't get a picture of in the, um, the PowerPoint presentation was also that, um, oh, I guess that was down. Anyway, the, we built little things to vibrate um, using these transducers. Um, yeah, so with these devices, we can affix them to any object, and that becomes a little speaker. Um, I don't know if you can, I can put it right on the microphone, it'll be very loud. Um, but so, in my case, I built a little teacup and affixed these guys to it. Um, and that audio comes from the video that's playing inside the Lambe Lambe. Well, no. Um, yes. I thought uh, it came from... Well, that, that yeah. actually, in my case, yeah, in my case, I had faked it a little bit. Um, because there our video didn't have really good sound. So I took recordings that Sarah had actually made of bees underground. Uh, in High Park. So good. This just kind of smoothly leads into how did I get here that kind of led to where we are now. And as Roberta mentioned, there are um, uh, installations that are outdoor, the nature of the materials and stuff, like I can hear that the pollen is squishy. I can actually hear that the pollen is squishy when they're unload, you know, like unloading it and putting it in. Actually, I can hear a lot and more that than that, but for this side, Their legs are fairly brittle against the wood, for example. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's, for me, it's meaningful. It's one of those things you don't know is meaningful until you've experienced it. And then you realize you're experiencing something meaningful. I, I might say a little more if I could read that video again, but um, it really came about uh, trying things uh, uh, to see what would work and what would be interesting and one thing led to another. So these cabinets were created and videos were taken. This video is by Veronica Latico um, of one of the first set of installations. Many people help me with these. Uh, so the concept was mine, but I'm not a, a, a creator of objects so much. But you really can hear what you're looking at. And so I wanted to create a mental image of biodiversity through uh, getting you outside to see what you normally cannot see. And this is all going on in little twigs, as Rob mentioned, under the ground, because most bees actually dig tunnels into the ground. But there's a whole set of bees, maybe 30% of all our bees, uh, look for cavities that already exist in, in twigs and uh, beetle bores in wood and loose bark. So there are a set of installations that I created uh, that allow people to just go outside and look at this. And in the, and one of them is in Hyde Park, as Roberta mentioned, uh, and on my website, Resonating Bodies, you can find out more about where you can see them. This is a bee fight, for example, uh, pretty interesting. So I started to um, want to get individual bees, uh, track them a little bit and have them filmed. And so I asked Stephen if he'd be interested and he was interested. On the left hand side you see some plain looking lambe lambe. And so I was uh, actually just sorting boxes and papers at a large studio belonging to the puppet mongers who very generously uh, allowed me to um, uh, rent space from them. And it's been a really inspiring place to be because there is something like 40, 45 years worth of puppetry in their studio. And among the many things I get to see in their studio uh, are some test pieces. So they gave a workshop on Lambe Lambe many years ago and had these that they did not need. Uh, the bottom one is from a student. As you can see, just two boxes thrown together. 
the top one, David, um, uh, David and Anne run the Puppet Mongers, so David Powell had, I believe, uh, made the top one. And so it, it was already kind of half complete, and I started asking myself, well, maybe this is a way I can share these videos and start to make some stories around individual bees. And the, you know, the, the, the pandemic happened shortly after that. So this was fall 2019. And uh, I started just kind of goofing around, just goofing around and putting things inside these boxes to see what they look like and finding that actually is a good way of telling stories about bees. And uh, we're looking at one of two boxes that came out of this. So this is the blue box, the masked bee. And of the poems uh, that Stephen has made, uh, this is one that has the poetry actually on the video itself. And this is uh, a shot from his video, which means that it's time for a video. some sound that's going on and that's coming through a vibrational sensor that is inside the actual um, uh, nest plank that's inside these cabinets and uh, when you're listening to it you tune out everything out except the bee itself and this is exceedingly small bee really small bee so the sound is very very small and uh, but the uh, this is macro video so you can see a great deal of detail of what's going on and uh, so this is uh, how I have um, uh, decided to, uh, you know, take these videos and, and, and use them. Um, uh, let me just uh, briefly... So this is uh, again what Rob was showing, uh, putting a transducer on a glass, it's vibrating the glass with the sound from the video, and making really pretty sound. Uh, this video is a different one we didn't use of some bees working with resin and had a very, very clear signal. So in this case you heard a lot of bee sounds together with the cup sounds. And um, the way this was uh, put into uh, the actual video here. So you can see uh, inside there's some lighting and there's some flowers and uh, the poem rolls out and um, can I say forced, forced perspective, does that make sense? Yeah, so you, you do feel like you're in a movie theater. There were already some fake flowers, I think, I think well those lovely curtains were there and I added a bunch of fake flowers. Uh, and decided to make it a kind of a movie-going experience. And there is uh, part two, basically, uh, to all of this is, is uh, the tray that has uh, other things going on about bees at the same time. Mine, I chose to have some berries. I chose some currants and some raisins. Uh, oh, actually not raisins, really blueberries. Blueberries and currants. Because when I think of pollination, uh, what's out there doing what in the world, I, I, in this part of the world, um, I think of those, those things, those bushes. Uh, do have hylaeus and others uh, pollinating them. And so we had a wonderful booklet available to us from Sandra Rahan Lab who's now at York University, and um, 
there are many bees involved in this little booklet. So they stand up on their own and they make a nice introduction for people. I have a, a loop that uh, we were going to use loops. Most people don't know how. We have some magnifying lenses. Uh, so you can see the bees up close. So I decided I wanted to include specimens. And actually, I was thinking of them as dead bees more than I was thinking of them as specimens as such. I had a bunch of dead bees that were just dead in our yard. They were dead from uh, living in the little abodes I have in our yard. They were found dead under glass tables. They were found here and there over the years. I just kept them. And I have noticed over the years that it's really hard to wrap your head around what is a bee if you don't see it and someone points it out to you because they're just so small, you don't get the scale. So in order for our audience to really understand something, I had really strong feelings that you need to see it and you need to see it on a stick where you're gonna see it or you're just not gonna get this. I mean, you'll see it on a flower as well. So that's the second half because the first half was where do they live? And the second half where they go together equal halves what do they forage on and mate on? And there are the plants and then there's the habitat. So this is about habitat and everything that goes with it. I, that's what I felt was something that could really come out of these experiments. So briefly I um, started, you know, kind of redoing this lambe a little bit. I'm calling it a lambe, but it's sort of not a lambe after it's not a theatrical work I feel, but It's, um, we can call it a theater box or a lambe, whatever, but um, I put little lights in it and uh, Rob was uh, doing a lot of technical assistance with lights and videos and everything. I decided to make some cell, actual cellophane uh, to go around the viewing porthole because these bees are actually um, regurgitating some cellophane-like substance, poly, poly Oh, does anybody know what the chemical is? No. It's a, kind of, it's a kind of cellophane anyway that waterproofs and also provides a kind of microbiome, uh, a lot of um, uh, microbes that are important for the survival of their offspring that they're going to lay an egg inside each cell, as you saw. And then I decided that the shape of the overall uh, theater box here suggested a marquee, and I had to wonder, well, what kind of marquee could I put here? I could put the name of the bee. I could say, introducing this bee. And then I thought, well, why don't I put what represents this bee in form or what represents this bee uh, scientifically and, and obviously colorfully. And so I went with what's known as a color barcode, which is the DNA translated, the DNA code, which we know as letters, translated into four colors. So there are four letters, they become four colors, and there's a, could be a subject of another talk unto itself, so I won't burden you with too much about DNA color barcodes, but I thought it fitting that maybe we could be not using too many words here. So here's the barcode of Hylaeus, looks a little fuzzy, I guess. Um, in this rendering, but thanks to Lawrence Packer and the Barcode of Life Data Systems, I, I was able to get a lot of barcodes. So I'll let you read that for a sec while I take a drink. So this started out, um, I'm just going to briefly say it started out when we made some uh, trading cards uh, 12 years ago for an earlier group show we did, and we put barcodes on the sides of these trading cards so you could compare them. Because I was wondering, well, you know, we know that things have traits that you can see in the real world. They nest with resin, they nest with leaves that are cut or leaves that are chewed, they nest in the ground, they nest in stems. They're all related closely or not so closely, in the same genus, not in the same genus. And this is reflected so, you know, elegantly in this snippet of a barcode, which you could compare on the physical cards uh, 
and you can sort of see some relations. You can spend a lot of time with these things, so I decided to integrate them in this case. Now, back to the bees. Uh, the bees I actually used in this exhibit, I just want to say uh, we, we did get bees, dead bees specimens from some scientists, so, uh, but we also used our own. So thanks to Lawrence Packer for a bunch of bee specimens and Sam Jorge at the USGS, the US Geological, Geological Survey, for giving us a bunch of uh, bee specimens and the Royal Ontario Museum. In my case, with this particular box, I used um, some bees that just didn't make it last year. So I have some of these in my backyard. They're the easy version, the simple DIY version in my backyard. In this case, we have three um, different uh, species going on here. Uh, so the uh, some of those are our little mass bee we've seen. Some are a different bee that uses mud, but the colored ones are an invader, a kleptoparasitic uh, wasp, which eventually um, ate some of the mass bees and some of them didn't. So I found in the spring, this spring when I looked, s lots of these guys made it and left, but two of them didn't. So I was able to integrate a mass bee that was dead anyway, but a fully formed adult, just dead on arrival, and one of the kleptoparasites. Or I shouldn't say klepto, I don't know if, uh, this is a parasitoid, so they will lay their egg uh, on top of the other egg, uh, or in the same cell as the bee egg. So the parasitoid wasp is also in the exhibit, and I gotta thank Rob Crookshank for having very delicate hands and uh, special uh, at eyes uh, for seeing things uh, up close and being able to mount my specimens. That's what this looks like without plexi. It's just kind of fun to watch what goes on in the backyard. Now finally I want to say about this that uh, the poem I decided I wanted to make sure people got the poem if they didn't stick around for the whole video. So it's wood burned on to the um, uh, the box uh, by Marianne Alberga, thanks to Marianne. And it's actually kind of a, a takeoff on some of our past Odes activities because it was first wood burned onto a cabinet. That's High Park, that's a cabinet in High Park, Sonic Solitaries. Sonic Solitaries has been moved a little bit in this High Park location, High Park Nature Center, but you'll find it. Uh, at first it wasn't painted, uh, that's the upper half followed by the lower half, and the lower half has the same poem on it. It's a really beautiful poem. So Stephen uh, created that poem for this cabinet in 2014. So uh, there's kind of a nice connection there. Typically the cabinets have a lot of different things in them. I'm just going to be really quick about the second lambay. It's a leaf cutter bee lambay, and it's totally different. You may recall that uh, it started out looking like that, and on the bottom, it's the bottom one, just plain cardboard. So I was working with the materials around me that the puppet mongers were okay with me experimenting with. I, I asked them to uh, let me know if I could borrow some of their um, plastic flowers and things, and some of their cloths, and so I just started dressing it up and playing with it. On the inside I had a bunch of things going on. I had some animals from home. I decided that because I had a, uh, a diagram of what goes on, I could include that in a, you can see a postcard on the other side I had of, of bees from a show Scott, uh, Scott McIver at the University of Toronto had had done a while back with his students. So you see a little more about the uh, wood burning that I could include. It was a gift actually from Chris Bennett who did the really nice pyrography we saw, the wood burnings on the very first cabinet in the very first video I started with. 
and I asked him, or I think I gave him this illustration. At one point, he just decided to take this illustration from Bernd Heinrich's book, which you can see on display at the museum, at Campbell House Museum, actually, in the bookcase. It's called uh, Bumblebee, uh, what is it called? Bumblebee Economics. So it's, a, uh, he, he, it's an illustration that uh, he took and made a beautiful wood burning of. So that's how it's integrated as a little bit of a teaching session inside a little fairy tree. Having seen some fairy trees that kids have been making, you know, beautiful little fairy tabloids around trees and reminding me of um, little magic beams that live in trees, I, I decided to go with this idea. And uh, Ellie let me know that there was uh, paper made of wood, so uh, that was really perfect. So I ended up dressing my lambe up in, like that. In the paper. So this is what the leaf video, leaf cutter video, looks like inside the structure, inside the lambe. But. Um, Yes, you can see the actual videos and the odes on the Resonating Bodies website on the page Odes to Solitary Bees as well. Um, I'm not sure. I think the sound becomes more evident as my camera moves because I was playing with our perception, our perception of audio and visual. I thought slapping a pair of headphones on this is boring. I don't want you to listen in headphones to this. I, I thought it was much more interesting to have uh, the, um, the video come through objects that have what has been pollinated and do the ringing. So in this, we'll see that there's a bowl and the bowl has some apples in it. So we saw that the poem is on a leaf in this case, and some of the bees I had that uh, eventually some of them did disintegrate over the, the winter. Um, and there's a cuckoo bee involved that was in our backyard dead, and uh, cuckoo bees are going to invade uh, a bee's nest and lay some eggs, and they're an amazing part of what's going on out there. And they're also on that wood burning that I just showed you, and uh, there, this cuckoo bee is orange. There's another cuckoo bee that is um, sort of uh, back here is um, blue, blue green. These are as I found them before. And here's the poetry. And as you can see, some apples. So on the website of Odes, you'll see the poem online, and the video is just separate. Ah, uh, that got sideways, but there are the transducers ringing the bowls, and uh, that's that's it. So that's what it looks like in in uh, Campbell House, and I think that's all I'm going to say at the moment. I'm Ellie Willoughby, as, as Roberta said, and uh, this is one of the examples of my prints that uh, are involved in the show. Um, this is a lino cut on, on Japanese paper, and that's um, a common eastern bumblebee in this picture with some cherry blossoms. So when Sarah uh, came to me with this idea of making these lambe lambe type theater boxes, and we were talking about what are our favorite bees, um, I was interested in, in bumblebees. I think bumblebees are a lot of people's favorite bees. A lot of people um, aren't as familiar with our native bees here in North America. And the one bee they can name if you ask them to name a bee is a honeybee. And honeybees are actually imported European bees. They're non-native and they're strictly agricultural bees. But if you ask people to draw a bee, even children, 
what they will tend to draw is a bumblebee. They'll draw something that's yellow and black stripes and it's fuzzy and, and frankly cute. Um, so bumblebees are well recognized and well loved, but what a lot of people uh, might not be as familiar with is that we actually have many, many different species of bumblebees and that sadly now in North America we have our first endangered uh, bumblebee, the uh, first bee species that's been put on endangered species lists both in the US and in Canada and that's the rusty patch bumblebee. So I decided that was the bee that I wanted to portray and I already had a lino cut print of a rusty patch bumblebee which you can see here and um, at the bottom there's a, a diagram that sort of shows you some of the bumblebees that were or are common um, in Ontario and that are often mistaken for the, the rusty patch bumblebee. The rusty patch bumblebee hasn't been uh, observed since 2007, but even when I was a child, they were one of the most common bumblebees here. Um, and these bees will come up a little bit later because the rusty patch is so rare now in Canada, um, I actually have stand-in bees on my display. So I have some of these Bombus uh, rufocintus playing the role of, of the rusty patch on my display, as well as one in a display case, kindly on loan from the ROM. So this is my lambe box. It's made of uh, wood and has a, a sort of a viewing portal in the front. Um, and I wanted, with my box, to really portray the way uh, bumblebees are ground nesting bees. And they live right at the surface of the ground with a round entrance. And they sort of have space that they use that's both underground and below ground. So my box has a skylight that's supposed to be reminiscent of the actual entrance for the bees. And I also wanted the idea that it was like they have an outdoor room. When we sort of personify them and relate them to our own lives, we have lawn furniture, we have things we put outside, so I wanted um, some furniture outside of the box. And so I've made um, this little chair here from twigs and um, some paper flowers that represent species that the bee feeds on and pollinates, uh, the meadow sweet, the thin-leaved sunflowers, and the New England asters. And this is a little hint at what's to come of what's inside the actual bee's home. Uh, a little sculpture of the bee itself, and you can see that sort of characteristic rusty patch along the back. Um, and then I used my own existing prints, the lino cuts of bumblebees. So I have the rusty patch bumblebee and the common eastern bumblebee as framed arts on the wall. Um, and for me, my video, which I'll get to a little bit later, doesn't include the poem. So I made a book for my bee with the poem in it and illustrated with a tiny little lino cut that's almost life size, a little bit big of a rusty patch bee. So that's what you would see if you were really sitting in front of the lambe. And it's, it's actually quite hard to illustrate them. It is something you sort of have to experience for yourself because there's, you peer into the box, you can shift your head and look in the different sides a little and see a little bit more. You can look through the skylight on the top and you see different things every time. But I was interested in really relating um, the physical objects in the bee's home to the things that the bee pollinates. Um, so specifically, this bee uh, did pollinate, uh, or does hopefully, where it still exists in the US, um, willows. So there's a hanging uh, seat that I've made from uh, willow branches. There's also some pussy willows and a vessel there on the side. Um, the wallpaper are leaf prints that I've made, and they feature brambles, which is another species they pollinate, but also just some others that would be common in its environment. So these are physically printed right from the leaves themselves on Japanese paper. 
uh, things like bluebells and um, uh, some columbines and other flowers. The bees' wings, I've also linocut to get the little uh, veins in their wings, and the cellophane to get the iridescence. And then the vessel at the back here that holds the pussy willows, that's made of beeswax because like the honeybee, the bumblebee also um, does produce some wax and it produces sort of oval shaped vessels that are actually called honey pots where it stores nectars for the, the larva. So that vessel is meant to uh, echo and mimic that shape. And the little table, like the one that's on top of the lamby, I've actually woven from dandelion stems. So dandelion is not uh, specifically linked to this bumblebee, but I'm sure you've all seen it is very popular with pollinators and bumblebees. And I've made some textiles too. So we've got these uh, little tiny little quilts and a little pillow that has images of pollinators. Um, there's another shot I'll show you later of the rug which I've woven uh, from wool, all of which I've dyed with different plant dyes taken from plants that uh, this bee pollinated. And there's a tiny little, you can only see a, a corner of it there, there's a little um, paper blueberry plant in one side and a melon in the other to give the idea of how um, these bees were actually important also for, for food that we eat. Uh, this is a shot from the top. You can see the, the little book a little bit better. You can see the sort of views that you get through the skylight um, and a different view through the, through the portal. So I got interested in, in the specific foods that this bee ate and the plant dyes that you could make from them. So I started with things like the orange jewelweed, which is a, a really lovely wildflower that we have here it's really quite common and it makes a wonderful dye and I so I dyed papers and I dyed uh, textiles as well and also um, the Canada goldenrod so that makes this gorgeous yellow color and I actually dyed the paper that I used on the prints themselves so these very portraits of bees are made with plants that they themselves might have pollinated um, and also uh, the other dyes that I worked with, uh, the willow, the sumac, uh, lilac, not a native species, but popular with these bees. Um, and dandelion is not documented as a food source or, or the rose, but you will often see uh, bees and bumblebees uh, landing on these plants as well. There are actually an extraordinary number of foods that uh, uh, of these bees that do make plant dyes, but they weren't all good fits for this uh, project. Uh, some of them, berries that these bees pollinate, they don't make light fast dyes. Um, a lot of these plants uh, bloom a little later in the summer and uh, it would be too late to produce it for this work. And some of them uh, were uh, roots that I didn't want to dig up in and, and kill plants, uh, kill trees or, or damage trees just to get uh, the dye. But I've also got some images here. This is my dye pot full of uh, lilac blooms and some of the, the wool that I dyed to make the rug in different colors that you can get from these plants. Um, here I mentioned earlier the, uh, the wallpaper and you can see this is, this is a bit of my process here where I was producing the leaf prints and, and wallpapering my, my box with just uh, plants that I found around uh, my, my garden and nearby parks. Um, here are some of the, the woven dandelion stem furniture, the hanging uh, willow chair, the twig chair that goes on the exterior of the box, the rug, um, uh, the tiny little quilt <laughs> that I made and the beeswax vessel. This is, these are for objects that go adjacent to my, my box to represent what the bee itself pollinated, so the, the artificial apple there, and another shot of the interior. The video for mine 
uh, came from work that Sarah and others uh, did, uh, the bumble uh, domicile, and they actually had a bumblebee's nest that was produced in, inside of their show in the gallery and filmed there and recorded there. All right, so I've, I've titled this How I Met Some of My Favorite Bees. Um, and um, actually, here's my picture of an agapostamin bee in, uh, in, in Rob and Sarah's garden. Um, and uh, um, <coughs> this was done, this was, uh, this was taken with a, a Canon Rebel EOS uh, camera, which was on loan from BizTech, which I think we had for two days. And um, this was like the first picture I snapped with it. So that's kind of fortunate. But um, uh, at the time that Sarah had asked me to maybe do some video, I was still wrapping my head around what a solitary bee was because I had this image of bees that lived in groups and we had a solitary bee and they, how do they fit their lifestyle into one bee? And so this actually, this whole, this work that has been going on over the last 10 years is, is what introduced me to um, the lifestyle of a solitary bee. Um, now this is, a, this, is a, this is a bee block um, at Sarah's house and that was where I kind of got to know my first solitary bee, um, which was um, a, uh, I'll just go over here, um, Hophlitis spoliata. Um, and it's a type of mason bee, um, which actually takes leaves and, and chews them up and makes them into kind of a mortar. So, uh, so here's, here's the video I took of that. And um, I guess one of my first reactions in, in getting to know these bees as individuals was I started giving them names based on my human interpretation of the character. And this bee seemed like she was like, you know, she wasn't fancy looking. Um, she was just kind of no nonsense, all business, always getting it done. And somehow or other that became Mary Jane. Um, this was a, a, the video turned out pretty well, but it was the first time I'd worked with the, uh, the, uh, the transducers that uh, Rob designed. And so um, we failed to get any sound. Um, so, but we, we have her working here. And you see that little kind of mashed up ball of leaves there, which she's kind of using as paste. It's very different from other bees that live in, that use, uh, use leaves to make their cells. And we'll look at that in a sec. And to see that, to see a bee actually working with leaves differently, look how she can bend her whole body, like a, like a, um, the flexibility of the people sort of look at, at bees and insects as having exoskeletons, so they're all very kind of, you know, sort of tough, but actually they're very bendy, squishy creatures. Um, okay, moving along. And, and so to get to know a leaf cutter bee, um, I, I had to deal with another structure, which uh, as Sarah had progressed from these simple bee blocks um, to the bee booth and um, had gotten one installed in this large garden area at the Toronto Zoo. And I think this picture is from August because it's mostly goldenrod around there. Um, so you can see, you can see that you can see the, the, the bee, the bee, you know, the, the bee block in there. You can see the cabinet door that opens and closes and you see the headphones you can listen to. And in the back you would see um, Rob's microphones on kind of wooden cones stuck into the back of the, of, of the booth. Um, and so I named, so here's the leaf cutter here. Here she is working with leaves and here she is with kind of, you know, with pollen on her underside where her scopa is. Um, a bumblebees or honeybees or any of the kind of apis bees are sticking uh, or corbiculate bees are actually sticking uh, pollen onto their back legs, um, where they have they have the their honey baskets. But but this type of bee actually have um, have the mechanism on on their abdomen, on their back segment, and on their underside. Um, now I named this bee uh, Gracie, and um, again it was my feeling about her character that compared to Mary Jane, who was just always at work. Um, this bee was also always at work, but she would she kept switching up what she was doing. She she would she would kind of jump from one tunnel to another, and would seem to forget what she was doing and so on. So I named her Gracie, um, probably unfairly, but that's my kind of anthropomorphization. 
Now this is some video that's not in the exhibit. And this is where she brought in this leaf bit, um, forgot about it, it dried out, and then when she found it again, she's like, oh, forget that, and, she, and so she, she pushed it out. So, so she just, you know, it was, it was actually a whole counterproductive moment for her. Um, but it, it, was, it was, I think, the longest time, like I, I spent like, like a, over a week just filming this one bee and, and felt like I got to know her, which is, I'm sure, a conceit on my part. Um, now, this is, uh, if we're talking, uh, move along. Um, now, if we're talking about favorite bees, I think I decided at some point my favorite bee was the Hylaeus bee or the masked bee. Um, which is, is, is as, as you've seen already in, uh, when, when Sarah was showing it, um, is it looks just basically like, a, like an ant, um, except they have like a painted face. Um, and, and so, they, so they, they, they're extremely basic looking. Um, and I, I, they're, they're from the, one of the more primitive types of bee. Um, but yeah, they, they chew up plant pulp and somehow turn that into this, this, this amazing cellophane material. So they're actually kind of magical creatures. Um, they also carry pollen inside their second, like in their crop, inside their second stomach, which um, people would know that's where honeybees carry um, uh, nectar. But these bees, which precede honeybees by, by quite a long ways, actually carry pollen and then have to have to disgorge it. And if I could find the poem, I actually wrote it on, oh, I know what I did here, hang on. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here we go. Um, the words have already started going by, and, and I'll just read the poem. It's a five-line poem, which I call a tonka, because tonka poems are five lines. Um, and any failure I have in meeting the form, I could say it's based on Tonka. Although, as I understand it, um, Tonka is actually um, a, a modern type of poem for Japanese people. And so the idea of having a certain amount of freedom with content is kind of baked into it. So maybe I can get away with saying this is a proper Tonka. But um, the Ode to Minerva, I named her Minerva, is She's the secret artisan of cellophane. Her phantom face obscures dark arts. Her body is perfected to hide. She disgorges spun glass and gold from her stomach's crucible, which may make sense after that little bit of biology I discussed. Um, and again, here is the, uh, here is the, here's the poem uh, engraved by wood burning into the cabinet that's at the High Park Nature Center. Um, and moving along to, okay, um, and then this is, oh yeah, one more, there we are, resin beads, um, uh, Mega Kylie Campanule, um, and this is, uh, this is not seen in the exhibit, there's actually other video, I think, from, um, Access Alliance, um, and, and it's, it's using the new kind of sort of windy, twisty tunnels that the uh, the bee boots have. So as I understand it, it's, it's this is closer to the kind of tunnels a bee might encounter. We can we can hear them if you turn up the volume. Oh yeah, I could do that, can't right. I? Uh, let's turn up the volume. Oh, yeah, there, there we go. I forgot about that whole part, but Sarah always remembers the part about the audio. So, um, and this was uh, I, I didn't edit this one. That was that was David Hughes. Um, who's actually a proper videographer. I'm kind of a working, you know, I'm kind of a learn as I work videographer. Um, but, and, and the poem actually is interesting because it's my first kind of group poem. Um, it, instead of naming individuals, because there were like so, so many of them, um, that I just wrote a poem for all of them. Um, and it's the Ode to Working Mothers. Um, they push lucent white globules into cornerless walls up and down tunnels that wind like script. Parallel labor, burnt ochre through dappled windows, liquid portals. Um, and uh, yeah, the only thing I'll, I'll add for that is, is just that um, it, was, it was something that I, I managed to take, vi I managed to take video while I was working on, on, on the book that um, 
as as you know as which got as I got busier and busier and busier with it, I still managed to have time to uh, to to do the, to uh, to take this video. And I guess the reason I had time is because Sarah asked me to do it. And actually, I would say the whole project, my involvement in the project is I think Sarah asked me to do videos and then asked me to write poems and then asked me to do more videos. And so. Thank you, Sarah, for actually getting me to do all these things, I guess. Um, and thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm done my part. And so it's called In the Landscape. And so, so much of this exhibit is about the landscape um, and you'll see that we have an artist statement if you go to the museum and read what we have to say about landscapes and and how we as uh, human beings, you know, are making a lot of decisions about landscapes. And so it's been a delight to create art that talks about some of the complexity in landscapes um, that might lead you to uh, not only enjoy the art, but go outside and maybe read some of the books that we've been suggesting uh, in the museum and so forth. So, uh, so this is a shot of, of the full piece. It's a little hard to photograph because there is projection as well as the artwork on paper and um, getting the light balance right and so forth. It's not, it's not straightforward. But uh, this is a very large sheet of paper uh, which has um, my artwork on it with the linocut prints of several species that are supposed to represent um, food sources for these bees that were in the installation that uh, Sarah had. Uh, this is a plank with the various tunnels in it and the bees are nesting inside. So each of these tunnels, if you look carefully, there's um, sort of a dotted trail coming from them to try and represent how these bees are actually interacting in the landscape. Um, and the trails are painted in um, fluorescent uh, pigments that entomologists use to track bees. And so they're going to the, the prints that I made for the common milkweed, there's some cherry blossoms, there's black-eyed Susans and echinacea, and some red bud. Uh, so those are pollen sources. They're going out into the landscape and they're actually cutting tiny little pieces out of leaves. So I gathered leaves from my garden um, that had these telltale sort of half moon um, cut pieces that are used by these bees to make their nests. And some of them are going out to gather resin from the cedar. So that's why there's cedar there as well. Um, and over here, this is more part, Sarah's part of the collaboration, there's a branch, there's wires coming from this transducer, um, and the wires are striped with the DNA barcodes of the bees that Sarah mentioned earlier. So these are just some uh, more detailed shots so you can see uh, the, the prints, uh, both the carved relief prints that I, that I made um, and the actual leaf prints, and you can see the tiny little uh, sort of cut pieces out of each of these leaves and the, the trails through the landscape. So I just, uh, I'll talk about um, where the video comes from and how the bees got into this idea. This is not Hyde Park, this is uh, Access Alliance Multicultural uh, health center. Um, it's a rooftop garden at Danforth and Vic Park. And uh, this here is the um, bee cabinet. It's uh, you know it's not that big, uh, but they're both the same size. Um, and the, usually they have this kind of programming. This is Lara Mursovsky who at the time commissioned this cabinet and uh, in 2000 and I want to say 14, 2014 to the present. Um, she and others who have worked uh, on the rooftop garden have been doing community programming. So some of that programming involved uh, hanging out with Susan Fry, uh, doing her PhD with Sandy Smith Lab at the University of Toronto. And uh, she is um, working with native bees as well. And so this is what that 
Uh, looks like up close you can see that she's listening while she's watching with a loop and it's a pretty long, um, I'm calling it a nest plank. It's got uh, double-sided tunnels, so tunnels on both sides of this nest plank and it's about 17 inches long. So on the left is the um, uh, pretty much what you see in the video and uh, when we talk about resin bees, uh, some beautiful globules of resin, you can see it right up close there. Rob took that photo. Uh, Susan's been taking some of these photos. Um, a variety of things were going on in this plank and uh, <laughs> like I say, uh, there's a super, super cool video that um, that we got. You know, be patient. Uh, we turned it right side up to project it on the wall. And uh, it was very fortunate uh, timing for him uh, to make this video on the roof. There wasn't a lot of other sound going on and you could really hear clearly what was going on in the video. Um, some bees were flying in front of it. Uh, the plexiglass was reflecting some flowers and uh, at least four bees were clearly visible doing their thing. Uh, and this is a nice long video. So, um, so that's what this is sort of based on and I will uh, kind of get moving along here. What we did is we projected it onto the wall. So at first I made an idea about what to do, a projection on the wall, some flowers, and uh, how to get the sound involved uh, was a, a thing to think about quite a lot. So uh, this is the vibrational sensor you don't get to see when you go to one of these cabinets, but it is recording, it is, it is amplifying uh, through an, uh, a custom made amplifier, the um, vibrations in the wood that a normal uh, uh, microphone or a normal sensor wouldn't actually pick up very well. And so incorporating that into the art, you can see here, I just took it and glued it onto a little piece of wood that's glued onto the paper with some wires coming off of it. And those wires are connected to, um, so, so there are four Bs you see primarily, and imagine four audio cables coming out the back there are cables that I connected that to. So I uh, have to do a bit of a jump cut here, but uh, try to imagine that these are the cables 
that represent the audio coming out of the back of that piece of paper that you're seeing this projection on. So on the right hand, you see the landscape, and on the left hand, you see uh, a connection to what we're looking at in the video. And um, also, importantly, who are they? Who are these bees? I thought I'd talk about them through barcodes. I could identify it with text, but I thought it a bit more elegant to use uh, the DNA sequence because you could actually sort of compare it, sort of. Uh, it, it becomes a, a, a beautiful sort of three-dimensional thing, I felt. And so uh, in my backyard, I wanted to see what that would look like. And uh, each one of these cables is representing a different bee. And there are, are more notes about this in the gallery. You can kind of get a more um, uh, detailed impression of what's going on with each of these bees and why they're different, but they all live next to each other and they're all operating in the same plank at the same time in the same garden, visiting the, s maybe not visiting the same flowers, but likely visiting many of the same flowers, depositing their own microbes, getting microbes from other bees. There are complex things going on in the landscape and so uh, that's really what we wanted to address in this piece. So there we go, that is actually a photo. You see Ellie's, she talked about, you see the projection, you see the, um, uh, can you see my cursor on this? Yes, you can. Yes. You see the uh, small vibrational sensor, which in fact is not acting as a vibrational sensor in the gallery, but it's there to, to, to represent how we got that sound and the barcoded. Um, cable that uh, brings together the sound of all these bees to you through some loudspeakers, uh, and um, that's that's how I tried. To, we wanted to put these things together. They're rather different, uh, the left half and the right half. But we're really pleased, are we? I think so. With how it came <laughs> together, and uh, there we are. There's Kemple House. Come to it. It's wonderful, lovely place, Kim.